So, Stan, Ralph, I really appreciate that you take your time and uh, be in this it's, interview. It's, uh, yeah, it's a real, real pleasure. Yeah, for me as well. I can't think of a better interviewer. <laughs> Great. Okay. Yeah. So, I would like you to tell us about what holotropic breathwork really means. Well, I think I would start by explaining the, the word, because it's the word that I, I coined myself. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, at a certain point, I, I was working with uh, non-ordinary states, first with psychedelic substances and plants and so on, and then um, with the holotropic uh, uh, breathwork. And um, I realized that we really don't have uh, a name for a certain important category of non-ordinary states. That current psychiatry talks about altered states and they're all considered to be pathological. So many people who have mystical experiences actually get diagnosis, they put on tranquilizers, they get a diagnosis and so on. Um, so there's an there's a important category of experiences that are healing, transformative, uh, that also uh, provide a lot of new information about, about consciousness, about the human psyche, um, you know, which don't deserve that term altered states. Altered means ch changed, uh, mm -hmm. you know, um, deformed in some way. Uh, suggest that, um, you know, there's a correct way of experiencing ourselves in the world and the altered states are some kind of a, a pathological, distorted version of that. But, uh, you know, I found out that, that you cannot say that about uh, the initiatory crisis of the shamans or the kind of state of mind that the shamans are inducing in their clients or entering themselves. The kind of states that uh, you see in the rites of passage of various aboriginal cultures, the, the states of mind that the initiates had in the ancient mysteries of death and rebirth, and also the experiences of the yogis, of the, of the Buddhists, of the Taoists, of the Christian mystics. You know, uh, those are very valuable experiences, mm -hmm. healing, transformative, uh, transforming people, and so on. Uh, so, um, I decided to, to, to um, make a name for the, this category of states. I call them holotropic. Holos means whole in Greek, and tropic is from uh, uh, from the verb trepein, which means moving in the direction of something, like um, the heliotropism is the property of the of the plant of mm -hmm. the flowers to always orient themselves towards the sun, follow the sun, aim for the sun, and so on. So holotropic means moving toward wholeness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it describes a certain subcategory of non ordinary states, which which are we have very positive value. Now, uh, the term um, moving toward wholeness, holotropic, uh, surprises some people because it implies that we somehow not, are not whole the way we are in our everyday state of consciousness. Mm -hmm. uh, so the best way uh, I would describe what's behind this term is to actually use the kind of a Hindu shorthand, you know, the, in, in um, the Hindu religion they would tell you, you are not nama rupa, you are not name and form, you are not body ego, we would say. Uh, you have in the core of your being uh, this sort of a divine spark, Atman, and they would give you a system of uh, exercises, of, of, of practices, and if you follow them, you actually get uh, experiential validation for that. It's not some belief, it's, it's something that you can experience. And when you reach that core, Atman, you realize that that energy is identical with the energy that created the universe. Mm -hmm. Atman, Brahman. So, uh, from this uh, perspective, you know, we experience ourselves only as a fraction of who we, who we really are. And so holotropic states make it possible for us to, to reclaim our cosmic status. You know, sometimes it's a small steps, sometimes it's a powerful experience that really takes us all the, all the way to that uh, realization. Mm -hmm. So that the term holotropic. That um, uh, my wife Christina and I um, 
when it was not possible to use psychedelics because they were abused on such a on such a wide scale and there was you know re um, repressive legislation against them then we develop uh, this uh, technique of holotropic breath work when you basically use very simple means just faster breathing um, focused attention on the on the breathing kind of a meditative state very much like what you find in vipassana buddhism and some other uh, meditative system mm -hmm. we use powerful evocative music much of it also coming from either shamanic traditions or spiritual traditions we use uh, kirtans bhajans we use uh, tibetan uh, ritual music we have balinese music uh, african drumming rhythms and so on and then we have a certain um, form of body work when the energy is blocked somewhere uh, after the session we can sort of help people to, to clear those uh, those blocks mm -hmm. so what you're actually saying is that we all have this inner spark this inner drive towards wholeness well that's you know that's what the hindu religion says but uh, i have been able to confirm it in my own experiences and, and work with a number of people over the years okay so now that you are a psychiatrist, uh, would you please share your view about the increasing antidepressant in the world? Well, we, um, one of the things that came out of this uh, research using the holotropic states of consciousness, as I call them, mm -hmm. was that we have um, in psychiatry an extremely superficial, inadequate map, model of the human being. Uh, the idea is that the, the psychological history of the individual begins after we are born. Freud said, you know, the newborn is a tabula rasa. There's really nothing that precedes birth, including birth itself. There's no recognition that, that the, the whole experience of the birth process has any lasting sort of uh, impact on, on people that it has influence on their personality, on their behavior and so on. Mm -hmm. And this was a, an error that we had to correct because without our programming, without our guidance, you know, people would move beyond that biographical level, infancy, childhood and so on. And they were reliving births and then further on they sort of um, reach all the way into the prenatal life and then before we knew people had ancestral experiences they had uh, experiences from the collective unconscious past life experiences and then also experiences of what Jung called the archetypal world the mythological world so deities or demonic presences of different cultures mm -hmm. even cultures that they never heard about or or that they you know didn't intellectually know so uh, once you have this kind of a large cartography of the cycle, the large model, mm -hmm. then suddenly many, many of the uh, disorders that uh, the, the current model cannot explain suddenly make sense. So for example, uh, depression has uh, very deep roots, not just in the, the postnatal life, in, in childhood, infancy, but uh, it's typically connected uh, with uh, a certain stage of the of the birth process the current theories of depression you know uh, actually fall into two categories one is uh, the biochemical one when you know the people don't even take psychological factors into consideration and it's all in trend neurotransmitters mm -hmm. catecholamines and so on and the other one, uh, the psychoanalytic one, is trying to explain depression from uh, very early postnatal life. Mm -hmm. And none of those theories really uh, can explain some very, very fundamental aspects of depression. Uh, the first is that we have two kind of groups of depression. One is that we can call inhibited, where people just feel sort of uh, depressed, sad, stuck in their life, in a kind of a no-exit, hopeless uh, situation. You know, they have um, frequently headaches, they have experience of pressure 
on the uh, on the chest. They might have uh, gastrointestinal problems, uh, constipation. They can even have retention uh, of uh, water, sort of in the in the body. And then there is another type of uh, depression that we can call agitated, and people are also depressed, but they are very expressive about it. Mm -hmm. Crying, they might be rolling around, or you know, tearing their hair or tearing their their clothes and so on. Acting so, out. Yeah. yeah. So none of those, none of those theories, whether the current uh, biochemical or the psychological, can explain these. Why we have these two types of of depression. Mm -hmm. We also have two types of suicide, which is closely related to depression. One is the non-violent, where people would take an overdose of, uh, you know, barbiturates or, or tranquilizers. They would be attracted to water. They would get drowned. Uh, or they would um, take, uh, they would, for example, use the carbon monoxide. Um, and the other type of uh, suicide is violent. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, you know, taking a car for a head-on collision or over the cliff or uh, f uh, firearms, weapons and so on, or jumping out of the window, jumping under a train and so on. Mm -hmm. So none of those two theories can really say anything meaningful about why this is so. Mm -hmm. They cannot also explain the connection between depression and mania. So what we see when, when people are in this inhibited depression, that there are usually some postnatal things, uh, situations where people felt victimized, you know, in a kind of underdog uh, situation. But then as they go deeper, they, dis they find out that the deeper root of that kind of depression is in uh, the phase of uh, birth, where the uterus contracts, uh, but the cervix is not open. So you're stuck in that situation. Mm -hmm. And then it suddenly explains the fact that you would feel kind of oppressed. You would feel the pressure on the chest or pressure on your so shoulders and, the, you know, the, the headaches and all that, mm -hmm. all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and also uh, the, the, there's a type of uh, suicidal tendency which is associated with this type of depression, which is the non-violent one, where people somehow are, are in this situation um, on the unconscious level have the memory that something better preceded which was being in the womb. So they're trying to do something that would have some elements of the, of the prenatal state, which is water, you know. The prenatal state is aquatic, mm -hmm. aqu aquatic uh, existence, or is a situation where kind of the, uh, the pain uh, and uh, the, the discomfort, the physical discomfort, starts kind of uh, dissolving with the, with the tranquilizers and with this, and it starts creating kind of a caricature of the, of, uh, the prenatal state. Mm -hmm. Now, if people have this agitated depression, then again, usually there are some um, postnatal situation where they were exposed to aggression or they lived in a family where there was a lot of uh, violence, tension, conflict and so on. But then on a deeper level they find out that they are tuned f through their postnatal experiences into the stage of birth when the cervix is already open and they are struggling to get out or the tension is kind of increasing. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, from that kind of uh, situation on the unconscious level, you cannot escape by going back because you would then end up in the completely hopeless situation mm -hmm. of what I call the second matrix. But they have the memory that following this situation there was something better which was actually being born. So their suicidal fantasies sort of simulate the situation what it was like at birth, where the tension actually builds up to a catastrophic kind of a resolution, inst it's instantly over and there is blood around mm -hmm. and sort of the inside of the body goes, goes out and so on. There's like a confusion between the, the biological birth and the, the, the psychological, mm -hmm. psychological rebirth. So uh, that reflects a very strange kind of paradoxical situation that we all were born because we're here, but we have not really come to terms with it emotionally. We still carry 
somehow that all those stages of the stuckness and the, the struggle, you know, uh, the little crying that happens after birth doesn't really uh, resolve that. And so when that starts surfacing really for processing, the organism is trying to get rid of that memory, then um, people can seek a situation that looks like biological birth because they're not aware of it, that it's an inner process. So uh, the, the solution in experiential work for that is actually uh, paradoxically to help people die but uh, keep the body intact. Mm -hmm. They just had the experience of dying, mm -hmm. which is then followed with the experience of rebirth. And, mm -hmm. and actually, this, when that happens, it has the spiritual element in it. So it's not just a reliving birth, but it's a psycho-spiritual kind of a death rebirth mm -hmm. kind of experience. Mm -hmm. And people also realized that uh, when they had this other type of suicidal tendencies, they really wanted to reach the prenatal state but again, if as, a, as an adult, in uh, the regressive work that we are doing, you, you go into the prenatal state, it's not just the uh, re replay of the biological situation of the fetus, but it would be like a mystical union. So ultimately, the suicidal tendencies really are sort of uh, some kind of a tragic mistake, misunderstanding, uh, where people really seek transcendence mm -hmm. of two different kinds. One is the kind of the oceanic type of, and the other one is the epiphany, kind of emerging into, into light. Mm -hmm. And uh, because our culture believes that we are a, a body, the only way people can think about dying is to destroying the, the body. Mm -hmm. But it's often, it's, there's an increasing tendency now to give people Prozac and whatever, you know, and that closes down your consciousness yeah. instead of really opening yeah, it up. What, what I was trying to get to is uh -huh. that there are ways of resolving depression psychologically, but uh -huh. you have to have this larger model. You have to go deeper than into postnatal, uh, postnatal experiences from infancy, from, from childhood and so on. And, uh -huh. Of course, you know, people are getting increasingly depressed because the situation in the world is not exactly uplifting. Mm -hmm. and, and psychiatry increasingly, you know, there was psychoanalysis where <clears throat> there was an effort to get to the core of the problems. But now the, the prevailing tendency is really suppressing symptoms mm -hmm. and confusing it for healing, mm -hmm. you yeah. know. And it's coming really from, from medicine. I mean, psychiatry is a subspecialty of medicine. But uh, in medicine, you use symptomatic treatment only if you simultaneously do causal treatment or in diseases where you don't have causal treatment that are incurable. You can't do anything else but help patients with the symptoms. Mm -hmm. It would be very bad medicine to just be satisfied with removing symptoms. Like somebody, you know, comes with uh, um, fever, high fever, because they have some septic conditions, and you would say, well, we'll put him on ice and put the temperature down and, and be satisfied with the result. So what you can do with this kind of experiential work is really to get to the, to the core, to you the can core. Be, rather than just mitigating symptoms. Yeah, and the core... Is, is what happens when you move into non-ordinary states of consciousness. You have yes. to, you yeah. have to really, yeah. you can't do it in talking therapy, mm -mm. you just cannot reach that level. Mm -mm. What about uh, post-traumatic stress disorder? You have something to say about that? Yes, we have worked with, with people who had some, you know, extreme forms who came to our, our workshops and they had, for example, the experience in Vietnam um, which is a major, major problem. Uh, you know, that's a number of years ago. The, the uh, number of people who suicided as a result of post-traumatic syndrome after being in Vietnam surpassed the number of people who were actually killed. Mm -hmm. And now in Iraq the situation is worse than it was in Vietnam because there you had at least a sense, this is our site and this is the enemy. 
but the soldiers who are in Iraq, they don't know who is the friend, who is the enemy, where it's coming from. They are kept there for extended periods of time or, or repeat, go there repeatedly. Mm -hmm. They came back mutilated and so on. So this is going to be a horrendous problem. Now, with the people, you know, we don't have any kind of a control study, just sort of occasionally people with this problem come. So what we find out is that in uh, the, the, the holotropic breathwork, when they regress to the level where there was trauma in, the, in war, but uh, they find out that it's completely entangled with the birth experience. Because since birth, they never experience anything comparable to what you are exposed to. Like in Vietnam, people were fighting in swamps and the, their, their uh, friends were getting sort of blown apart, there was blood and guts and so on. And birth has those kinds of, you know, uh, elements in it. So the, the memory kind of brings them close together, almost to the point that it becomes like one complex. So we almost have to go and the resolution comes through death, rebirth, through, through that process that we have been just talking about. Mm -hmm. Some people would be scared of moving into that space because they would think that it would be some kind of re-traumatization. Well, this has not been our, you know, mm -hmm. has not been our experience mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the circumstances are very, very different. Yeah. And, you know, we create a certain supportive uh, environment. And there's also, on some other level, there's a knowledge that this is a, a safe situation in which you are experiencing uh, something that was very dangerous when it was happening originally. Mm -hmm. So the situations are not the same. And also there in the original situation, you did not have the kind of support that we, we create in the, in the holotropic breathwork. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. There are some studies now happening, for example, Michael Midhofer and Annie Midhofer, who did the training, actually, the whole holotropic. Both psychiatrists, yeah. Yeah, they, get, they now got the permission to use uh, MDMA, which is a psychedelic substance, and they uh, described some really remarkable results with the post-traumatic syndrome. Mm -hmm. And you can do something similar with the, with the non-drug approach, with the, mm -hmm. with the holotropic breath. Right? So they're actually doing this research in, in yeah, the States? Yeah, permission, they offer okay. permission. Yeah. Okay. What about addiction? Uh, you know, addiction is, seems to have sort of two components. One is some kind of a chemical situation. Because there are people who can drink a lot and they don't become alcoholics, you know, and then other people get, get hooked and they go through the typical sort of alcoholic process where you become uh, less uh, responsive, you have to increase the dosages and then towards the end even the big dosages don't help and then there is hitting bottom and that's usually the turning point. Mm -hmm. in, you know, for many drug addicts and alcoholics, it's a hitting bottom against a death rebirth type of experience. But there are also the psychological factors, you know. Again, there are, there are connections among others on, uh, on the level of birth, that people who uh, are in that, uh, in that inhibited type of uh, uh, depression, they, they tend to uh, use uh, sleeping pills, they tend to use uh, some kind of what we call downers, something, you know, that's, uh, that's going to have sedative mm -hmm. effects and it creates a kind of a caricature of the prenatal situation. Um, we have done actually large studies, uh, controlled studies with psychedelics, we haven't done controlled studies with uh, the breastwork, although we, we have many people in the workshops and also in our training or recovering mm -hmm. and who find the, the breathwork very useful um, if you know the 12-step the, the program. Mm -hmm. So they find it uh, something that um, meets the criteria for the 11th step where you sort of um, promote through, you know, through meditation, through prayer, the connection with the higher power, mm -hmm. with, with God. You know, whatever that, that word means means for you. 
So people who, who now had these, uh, these uh, experiences of uh, going into the prenatal state and the, the mystical experience, they would tell you, this is what I wanted, I mm. didn't want alcohol. So it's a kind of a misguided, again, misguided search for transcendence. Mm -hmm. The longing yeah. towards oneness or wholeness. Yes, yes. Or... Alcoholic, alcoholism is like a mild form of suicide, mm -hmm. it's, but it's the same kind of psychological mechanism. Mm -hmm. But you can also see uh, drug addiction in people for um, whose psychology, the um, what I call the third matrix, is more uh, relevant, which is the the stage when uh, there is a struggle. To, to get out, and that's usually people where there was heavy anesthesia in <clears throat> in birth. Mm -hmm. We have now a real epidemic, you know, in particular in the United States, uh, of drug addiction, and it seems to be happening in the gen generation that was born after they started using routinely um, anesthesia. Scary. Heavy yeah. anesthesia in, in birth. That's scary. <coughs> so when you think about it, uh, unless you know, unless there's some prenatal problems, birth is the first major challenge. And uh, if um, you uh, would have natural childbirth, you sort of you go through the uncomfortable uh, experience, and then you reach kind of a successful resolution. So it leaves you with a kind of a, a cellular imprint of optimism. If difficulties come, you know, I can cope with them. Mm -hmm. I've done once, big job, and when I was being born, of course it's not conscious, but, uh, but there's a cellular imprint of that I can really deal with difficulties. Mm -hmm. and, and if I stay there, there is a, there's a way out of this. Now, if there was uh, heavy anesthesia, then you create an imprint, as it is called, you know, the very early kind of a learning that if things get difficult, you go for drugs. That's the way out of a difficult situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I believe that a lot of the addiction is really created by, um, you know, uh, uh, kind of excessive routine use of anesthesia, even in situations where mm -hmm. it's not necessary. I mean, you know, I am in medical background, so I know there are situations where you have to use anesthesia. Mm -hmm. There's no reason to use it sort of uh, routinely. It's done a lot of it for comfort of the of, of the obstetricians and the you know the nurses and so on, or uh, they don't, they don't feel comfortable with women screaming and uh, you know the drama of that. We have actually had experience when, when we work with some obstetricians that they found out that that they were attracted to that profession because they had some unresolved issues mm -hmm. from their own early mm -hmm. early history and uh, those are then people who have low tolerance of, of watching the drama of birth and they tend to handle it medically. Mm -hmm. So you can say we're moving towards wholeness and, and healing with our physical body and, and we're also doing a, a psychological level. What about moving towards wholeness on a spiritual level? You know, in, in my experience, it's really very difficult to separate those two. In the old times, like in shamanism, there was no difference. Mm -hmm. I mean, spirituality and healing were sort of two, two sides of the same uh, coin. Uh, also, let's say, in, if you do see uh, the Kalahari Bushmen doing a trance dance, it's a very spiritual event, but it's also a healing event. Or in ancient Greece, there were the, uh, the, the temples of incubation, the, the temples of Asclepius and so on. So this is a you know, modern thing in the, in the industrial civilization that we have sort of uh, priests and we have doctors and they are sort of doing different things. So this came for me you know, as a tremendous surprise because I did not have particularly religious background. Mm -hmm. uh, there was some conflict in our, uh, in the history of our family. When, when my father and my mother got together, they fell in love in a small Czech town. They wanted to get married. And my mother was from a strictly Catholic family. My father's family didn't have a church affiliation. And the local church refused to marry them because my father was considered to be a pagan. 
by the definition. And then my grandparents found this brilliant solution, which of course was a major financial donation to the church. And then they changed the rules, <laughs> you know, the, the wedding happened. and. So the dream of my grandparents came true. They, they lived on Main Street uh, across the church so they could stop traffic. And they rolled out carpets, you know, from the house to the altar so that the guests could go from the altar right to the banquet in the house. And my parents got so upset by the situation, they decided they wouldn't commit me or my brother to any religion. Mm -hmm. They said, you would cho we would choose our own way when we come of age. So I had no exposure to religion. Because I didn't have religion, I was uh, excused from classes. We had actually classes for religion. And for me, that was an hour of leisure. Mm -hmm. I would read a book or go for a walk. Or if some other people, you know, kids were playing soccer, I would join them. So I'm a strange example of somebody who was brought to spirituality and mysticism through, you know, clinical and laboratory work. Usually it's the other way. Mm -hmm. It is the other way around. So I had no precon religious preconceptions. I was really uh, pretty much, I would say, atheistic or, you know. And um, it was uh, in my own experiences, but also in the work with others. When I worked with patients, uh, when we were trying to get to the, to, the, to the core of their problems, we didn't find it in childhood and in infancy, or we found something, but not, not the whole story. And it took us to the perinatal level, mm -hmm. to, to the birth level. And then once, once the experiences reached the, the level of birth, then uh, a new element, new quality came into the sessions, which Jung called luminosity. The experiences felt sacred. It, it was not, uh, you know, it was not interpretation. I mean, it was an experiential quality of that. Mm -hmm. It's like if you're watching black and white television and suddenly colors would come in, you know. So this, uh, this whole uh, r spiritual uh, realm just opened up already usually in connection with birth, but then there was beyond that, beneath that, there was a level that we now call transpersonal, where suddenly you had past life experiences, you had uh, experiences of encounter with uh, what's called archetypal beings, mm -hmm. and, you know, gods and goddesses of, of different cultures and so on. I worked uh, with people who were Marxists, people who were you know, positivistic scientists, cynics, skeptics, atheists, and so on. And once the self-knowledge, the self-exploration reached that level, they all would become spiritual. Uh, so, um, you know, one aspect of it, this was process of healing, of therapy, but then at a certain point, all by itself, again, without any programming, actually to my surprise, it became a process of spiritual and philosophical quest. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some of the most healing experiences were actually those that had spiritual quality. Mm -hmm. Experience of, you know, oneness with the universe is extremely healing if it's properly uh, supported and properly integrated. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, in our culture, people get diagnosis and, you know, I have seen situations where people had what with, uh, with, in other cultures would be considered a very um, wonderful mystical experience and uh, they came home and you know the, the family saw that they were very strange and they called the ambulance and they, they would get hospitalized mm -hmm. for that. Mm -hmm. Now Ramdas was a, you know, um, used to be uh, Richard Alpert, he was a Harvard professor who did some psychedelics and, and the whole spiritual realm opened for him. And he went to the Himalayas and found a guru, uh, Karoli Baba. And uh, in that context, we did a lot of meditation and a very powerful uh, spiritual experience. And in that state, he went down to the village to get some uh, um, cookies. And he walked into the, to the shop and got the cookies and wanted to pay. And they, the guy who was selling there looked into his eyes and says, not today. 
you know, not in the special state. You know, are the cookies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Namaste, you know. Namaste. So in our culture, this would have a very different ending. Yeah. Yeah. So you differ between the, um, the term religion and spiritual. Very, very Yes? Spiritual. How? Well, we, we, uh, when we talk about these spiritual experiences, we use the term now transpersonal. Uh -huh. And if you look at the history of religions, at the, at the beginning, the origin of all religions are in these experiences, transpersonal experiences. All the founders of religion, you know, Muhammad, uh, Jesus, Buddha, you know, um, you name it. All the good guys. Yeah. Uh, they, had, they had experiences, numinous experiences, transpersonal experiences. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we would not have the religion. I mean, and not just the founders, but but their uh, you know their disciples, the the um, prophets, and so on. Now, when then when religions become organized, what happens very frequently that the the secular concerns uh, take over about possessions, money, uh, politics, and so on. In Christianity, I think a significant part of it was that they were persecuted and they had to organize themselves. And in the process, somehow they lost the connection with, mm -hmm. the, with the real source from which Christianity came, the mystical, mystical source. So once you have once you have organized religions, that what happens that they uh, they uh, they relate to certain uh, we would say you know archetypal images, they choose certain forms uh, that they worship. And they unite a certain group of people who see it the same way. And in that sense, uh, you know, religion unites. Religion should unite. Relig religo means uh, binding together. Mm -hmm. You know, something that before was fragmented. Uh, but what happens with these kinds of religions that they also set that group against another group that has found a different uh, kind of different symbolic images for the for the divine, and the, the differences are enough for bloodshed, for mm -hmm. for wars, for killing, and it's not just uh, between different religions, but if the fractions or factions happen frequently within the religion, so we have. Uh, you know, centuries of problems between Catholics and Protestants. And in, in Islam, they have the Sunnis and the Shiites mm -hmm. who kill each other. And then even India, you have the, you know, the Sikhs got into conflict with the, uh, with the Hindus, which were enough to kill. And now, more recently, Muslims and, and Hindus are killing each other mm -hmm. for dif their differences in uh, understanding uh, God, understanding the, the divine. Mm -hmm. But all the great religions have also mystical branches. There are the Sufis in Islam, there are the Christian mystics, there are the Hasidic Jews, there are the, uh, the Kabbalists, and so on. Um, and, uh, you know, the mystics actually that get through these uh, archetypal images to the source out of which everything comes. The mystics of the of the world they get together just fine. It's the organized religions that have differences with their dogmas and mm -hmm. so on. Mm -hmm. And very frequently, people who are involved in this never had spiritual experiences. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have to have a spiritual experience to make it big in an organized religion to mm -hmm. become mm -hmm. a, an official. You know, in a, in a religion. So the religions so, separate us instead of binding so, us. Uh, I hope that what we will, will have in the future, and that's also the philosophy of the holotropic breathwork, that we, that the religion would create a context for people within which they could have personal spiritual experiences and also offer them some, some method through which they can reach personal experiences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they would not have any investment whether it will take the Christian form or the Buddhist form. It would be what's called ecumenical, you know, or ecumenical, at least they try to sort of tolerate each other. And so I'm talking even beyond that, that mm -hmm. we really, 
you know, generally have tremendous uh, appreciation for spirituality, but we understand that ultimately it all aims for the same source. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to get stuck somewhere, uh, you know, in the, in the middle of the journey and that into conflict with other people from another religion who are also stuck halfway somewhere. Talking about the, yeah, so with the, that lead us into talking more about the global situation. I mean, that's really stuck with the religions fighting you against... Know, people, people in the transpersonal circles, uh, they believe that what we see in the world is this horrendous global crisis. Uh -huh. It's many, many different dimensions, many different symptoms, economical, political, uh, military, and so on that uh, ultimately they are uh, just just expression of one underlying problem which has to do with the state of consciousness evolution of the of the human species mm -hmm. and uh, unfortunately we're trying to solve the the problems in the world by using the same strategies that got us into this trouble in the first place you know um, and and einstein sort of uh, pointed out that it's there's no way of, of solving the problem if you approach it that way. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the really strong conviction in the transpersonal circles is that the only real hope for us is uh, inner transformation of, of a large sort of groups, ma you know, mass scale, uh, where they would uh, somehow, first of all, uh, clean somehow the the pockets of aggression that mm -hmm. we that we carry, a part of which is birth, but uh, it could go beyond that. It could be karm, karmic, and, and, and of course postnatal as well. Uh, but that they also experience this kind of spirituality that unites, that's universal, that's sort of all-encompassing, all all embracing. And you know, if we had a situation where we had the heads and the hearts in the right place, we could solve the, the problems. We need a, we need a planetary situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. People transcending this kind of narrow nationalism and, uh, and sort of religious, you know, uh, sectarianism and so on. Uh, uh, so, um, you know, I, I believe like what Krishnamurti said, is the only revolution, real evolution, is the inner revolution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have seen many revolutions that were promising a lot, the French Revolution and the Bolshevik Revolution. And uh, the situation after the victory of the revolution didn't exactly meet somehow the, you know, the expectations because people didn't change. So that's, that's really the solution of the global situation that people has to change individually. Yeah. Well, the, the question is how it, how it could be done. You know? yes. I mean, I have seen the, that kind of transformation that we are talking about uh -huh. in many individuals, mm -hmm. you know, but uh, how to do it in a way that would really uh, include, you know, many, many people mm -hmm. in different countries. So we have done these uh, breastwork groups, you know, large groups, we the International Transpersonal Conferences. Our largest group was 360 people mm -hmm. doing the, uh, the breath work. And people come from many different countries. They were like in Prague, there were 35 countries mm -hmm. uh, available. And we have trained facilitators who can help with these groups. And people come, they have language problems. They come from different countries. They come from countries that uh, have been hostile to each other, you know. We as Czechs, we had bad experiences with Germans, and then we had bad experiences with the Russians. And if you go further in history, uh, you know, France hated in England, and England hated France, and even the Scandinavians, who have, you know, such uh, very, very good um, reputation now along these lines, you know, we're not always that way. We have in Prague, we have a big kind of panoramic painting which shows the Swedes and the Charles Bridge in Prague. Mm -hmm. They invaded mm -hmm. Prague and of course there were the Vikings and so on. So if you, if you go uh, far enough, everybody's everybody's enemy. So in the Second World War, you know, the Russians and the Americans and British were friends, the, the Japanese, the Italians, uh, the Germans were enemies. Then after the wars, 
Japan was, was friendly, Italy was friendly, uh, but the Soviet Union was the enemy, and half of Germany were the enemies, the other ones were, were the friends, and uh, I mean, you can go on and on. Mm -hmm. And so in these groups, we have people who carry some of the grudges mm -hmm. from certainly the most more recent history. And in the breastwork, it's quite amazing to see how these differences dissolve when people um, honestly confront their own problems. Mm -hmm. And then people who are assisting them, they feel you know, a lot of love for them and they create, within a few days, they create very profound bonds with each mm -hmm. other. Mm -hmm. So uh, this was very, very, very hopeful you know, exactly how that could be those kinds of methods that can do that would be introduced on a large scale. You mm -hmm. know, so that's another problem. And challenge? What would your wildest visions be with the holotropic breathwork for the future? Well, you know, there were people who were able to do, let's say, um, a meditation for peace on a global level. They can sort of organize, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and then they meditate at the, the same time. Mm -hmm. Now we could, because there are no limits how many people can do the breathwork as long as you have enough trained people mm -hmm. to support it. Mm -hmm. You know, once we, we do the sharing after it, but once you get beyond 30, then you have to share in small groups. Mm -hmm. And it's much more powerful when you do it in a in a large group. Mm -hmm. So you could have thousand people breathing to, breathing together, you know. Easily. And so uh, I mean we could we could have events like that and uh, beyond that it wouldn't have to be simultaneous. I mean if people in many different countries would actually involve I'm not necessarily selling holotropic breathwork but some you know really effective systematic spiritual practice in their own you know, shamanic techniques and all mm -hmm. kinds of other methods, but they all have, what they have in common is you go, you want to transform the world by transforming yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not believing that you are okay, there's no problem. As far as you're concerned, uh, the problems are all with the others, mm -hmm. you know. And, uh, uh, there's a very interesting book by uh, Sam Keen, which is called Faces of the Enemy. Mm -hmm. That two, you know, two countries that are at war, they portray each other in a certain way. They become dragons and uh, octopus and a spider and so on. And we found out that those are exactly the images that people would draw after they had uh, a birth experience. Mm -hmm. This is the kind of symbolic imagery that comes with, with birth. So what seems to be happening is that uh, it's like a projection of the shadow. Well, like for example, Bush today, he has the feeling that there are no problems with him and mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. Americans. Mm -hmm. We are sort of we are the people of God, and then there's the the um, evil, you know, axis out there, and then he he goes and fights.